Okay. Uh, some moments of inertia that you need to know. You simply need to know these. I'm not going to give you a formula sheet with these. Uh, you just need to know these uh, moments of inertia. And I'm a little embarrassed because I did a whole sequence of analysis uh, using a wrong moment of inertia, as I'll explain in a minute. Okay. Uh, now, all these moments of inertia are calculated by integration. And the integrations are straightforward. They're uh, first year calculus integrations. Uh, generally, in an engineering calculus course, you will have done moment of inertia integrations and general moment uh, integrations. So there should be no mystery about how these are obtained. But we'll see that later. We'll go through those details, but not right now. Okay. <clears throat> if you have a uniform disk of mass M radius R, now there's some conditions that I'm not writing down here. Uh, this would be a disk, say like this, rotating about an axis perpendicular to its plane and through the center of the disk. And I didn't want to write all that out. Your book defines these very clearly. They have a table that gives you the same information. Okay, uh, That uniform disk has a moment of inertia, 1 half mass times radius squared. Now, by comparison, a hoop where all the mass is around the rim of the hoop. Okay, There's no mass distributed between the rim and the center. It's all at the rim. Then in that case, every particle is a distance r from the center. So you just sum up the little mr squared for every particle, and you get big mr squared, because the little m's add up to the big m. The masses of all the particles add up to the whole mass of the hoop. All the hoop is at, radius, is at uh, distance r from the center so that the moment of inertia is big M R squared. And you should remember that the moment of inertia is obtained by adding up all the little M R squares. OK. Now, uh, you, you see that the uniform disk has exactly half that moment of inertia. Now, there's uh, you know, a lot of things you can understand about why that's true, but just uh, only a little bit, uh, you know, of the mass is out there at or near the full radius r on a disk. The rest is smushed in closer to the center. Now, it's uniformly distributed between the center and the rim. But the point is that the little r of most of the particles in that disk is not at or close to the rim. So that by spreading out the masses over uh, r's that go from 0 all the way out to big R, um, you're going to get less moment of inertia. Okay, So the uh, little r, the distance of the various points from the center, is usually less than big R, so that you have uh, a moment of inertia that's uh, less than that for the hoop. For a sphere, okay, you got a sphere, axis through the center. Uh, as you go out from the axis, you intercept less and less of the sphere. At the center, you intercept most of the diameter of the sphere. You get out toward the edge, you're only going to intercept just a little bit of the sphere. And what I'm talking about, if I uh, draw a sphere over here with the axis, okay, uh, near the center, if you go down a line through the center, okay, you intercept that much of the sphere. If you go out closer to the edge, you intercept only this much of the sphere. So you have the mass of the sphere more concentrated than the mass of the disk as you approach the center. So that the mass of the sphere is budged up at smaller little r's, at smaller distances from the center, than the mass of a uniform disk, uh, of course, if you assume the same mass. So for the sphere, you're going to expect less moment of inertia than you would for a disk for the same mass and radius. And that's the case. Here it's 2 fifths times big M R squared. Now, rod rotated about the end. Um, in several videos, I used 1 12th M L squared because I wrote it down without thinking. Um, I'm perfectly aware that you got a 1 3rd and a 1 12th in there, and I just didn't bother to think. So that's a little embarrassing because a lot of what I did is uh, 
less applicable than it ought to be. But we'll go back and, and try to fix that. Um, not all that bad for what I was trying to convey, but there's certainly an error there. Okay, rod rotated about the end. Uh, if you got the rod rotated about the end, then uh, the average distance of the points on the rod from the axis of rotation is greater than if you have the same rod rotated about the middle. So if I'm rotating this rod about the end, and if I do this and wave this back and forth, I can certainly feel the uh, inertia, the moment of inertia. Uh, as opposed to rotating about the middle, well, all the points from here out are further from the axis of rotation than any point is if I rotate it about the center. So on the average, uh, the distance of the particles is twice as great. A average of the distance of particles from the center is twice as great if a rod is rotated about its end rather than the middle, giving you a moment of inertia that's four times as great here than it is here. And uh, we'll integrate this. We'll see how the integral works out. It's a fairly simple integral. Uh, but these are the formulas, and you've got to know those formulas, whether you understand where they come from or not. You also want to understand where they come from, because you might well be asked to derive one of these moments of inertia on a test. Okay. Now let's go to the situation we've been analyzing, where we have a disk of radius r, moment of inertia i equals big M r squared. And implicitly, the mass of the disk is m, big M. Mass hanging here is little m. Now, e you're going to want to probably think of the uh, disk and the mass as two separate things, but it turns out we can think of the disk and mass as one system with one moment of inertia. So this is one system, one moment of inertia. Our total is going to be the MR squared for the disk plus the moment of the mass little m. Okay, what's the moment of the mass little m for this system? Well, the mass little m is constrained to always lie along this line of motion. So the line of motion of the mass little m is here. And that line of motion passes within a distance r of the axis of rotation. So in that sense, this mass m is always at distance r from the, ma from the axis of rotation. So line motion of the mass m is always at distance r from the axis of rotation. So its moment of inertia for this system is just little m r squared. Follows that i total for this system is big M r squared. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. Um, writing things down without thinking about them, something that I try to discourage in my students, and I should probably practice it myself. I is 1 half m r squared. So total moment of inertia is 1 half m r squared, big m r squared, plus little m times big r squared, because big r, the radius of the disk, is the same as the distance of the line of motion of this mass from the uh, axis. Now, don't confuse a line of motion with a line of force. They're 
they're identical in this case, uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, it's not always so for every system. So if we had a little wheel attached to a big wheel with a descending mass, and we wanted to find the moment of inertia of the system, we could find the moment of inertia of the little wheel, moment of inertia of the big wheel, and as we've seen, moments of inertia are additive, logs are about the same axis, <coughs> and uh, the moment of inertia of this descending mass, M. <coughs> 